Today we have Bundeep from Finekia. Your news release this week was outstanding, Bundeep. Thank you. It was talking about providing real substantial uh, data that the crypto market is not only here, but it continues to grow. Can you talk to us about this? Sure. So our news release, by the way, thank you for having me. Um, always a pleasure to be here. The crypto markets are often seen to be something that's you know unregulated and harder to access. And the exchange traded products is a vehicle to provide institutional investors access to crypto assets. Effectively, they are listed securities like exchange traded funds, exchange traded products are basically exchange traded funds or exchange traded notes, and they have underlying crypto assets. So for financial institutions looking to get exposure to either crypto assets or the yields generated from crypto assets, ETPs are a great instrument. And what we saw last year in 2022 was despite the market downturn, despite you know some pretty uh, big Lehman-like moments in the crypto industry, the number of ETPs increased, they doubled. And in the last month, this January 2023, we saw the AUMs increase and the AUMs increased at a greater proportion than the overall crypto markets. So crypto markets, as you know, again, came above $1 trillion in market cap. Uh, that was about a 33% rise. The AUMs, that's the assets under management for ETPs, actually rose 39%. So that reflected about an 18% premium on the actual crypto assets. So what does that mean? Demand for institutional quality products that can be purchased by traditional finance, financial institutions is on the increase. And that was a big takeaway. And that was a bit of a surprise. All right, so let's talk to our audience. We have a lot of members in our audience audience that are very conservative. They like asset-backed investments. They are watching this sector with interest, but they do prefer having a bar of gold in their back room, okay? But they don't want to discount this particular sector. Can you talk to us a little bit about how those investors can move into your space and feel a higher level of confidence as they're making investment decisions to round out their portfolio? This is a long-winded question because as you pointed out, institutions are continuing to make this investment in this space. Do I have it correct? Absolutely. So you gold is a good proxy for a lot of people, but you know, just like in the early days of the internet, people saw the internet as being a replacement for film or television or radio or magazines. It was all of the above and none of the above, right? So it created a brand new paradigm, a brand new paradigm for communication and ultimately for transactions. Similarly, Bitcoin is not a replacement for gold. It is similar to gold in, in so far as it is an asset um, and that's fungible, but it's also like a currency that you can use for buying and selling. But it's also like a stock because it gives you a yield. In this case, it's in the form of uh, staking fees. Um, and yet it's got a stored value element to it, which is down to the basics of gold. So it reflects multiple financial assets. And that's the kind of beauty and charm and perhaps also some of the confusion around that. Is it a stored value product? Is it a unit of measure? Is it a transaction mechanism? Well, it's all of the above. But the one thing that I can say is there's no other asset class by far that has given the returns that Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies have given in the past 15 years of its history. And that, for someone looking at where the next 15 years would be, is, is a bit of a rear view, rear view mirror look and seeing what the future might possibly hold for you. And earlier in an investor talk, which you hosted, you were discussing uh, how the international market is a lot more uh, is a lot more aggressive about appreciating what's happening with the crypto assets at this time. And you were referencing an event you went to in Dubai. Would you like to provide our audience kind of an update about not only the audience that was there, but the interest? The approach towards cryptocurrencies is fairly binary, right? So you have some governments taking very harsh views on it and other ones taking a very liberal view to it. 
the UAE has become a place where innovation is encouraged in the, in the digital asset economy. And therefore, it's becoming a magnet for large industry participants to converge. One such event took place last week. It's called the Satoshi Roundtable. It was the ninth year of its existence. And as the name suggests, it was very crypto-oriented. People who were there included the heads of Binance. Uh, Tim Draper was a noted Silicon Valley and, and cryptocurrency investor, um, among several others. Uh, Coinbase, you name the top companies out there, they were there. And, and aside from the, the large investors, you also had a number of young startups. And that was a real surprise for me, a pleasant surprise, of course. So, you, you know, you saw the fidelities of this world who were showing how they're making crypto asset purchases more possible for U.S. retail investors. At the same time, you saw you had a whole bunch of young companies showing the utility of new products and new protocols coming out. Now, the framework for participating in this digital economy is being created in certain countries. Some countries in Europe, um, the UAE, Dubai in particular, is also is very positive towards that. Japan has some good frameworks for that. And that contrasts with some of the trends we're seeing in China and the US, which is much more restrictive. It's, it's on the other end of that binary one. And, and I think that's to their detriment because countries that are encouraging it are seeing capital inflows, they're seeing startups come through, and they're actually seeing some cool new products that no doubt we'll be seeing. You know, I'll, I'll give you one um, anecdote here. I was involved with advising Skype in the very early days. And one reason why Skype could not start in the United States in Silicon Valley is because the two founders had set up a company called Kaza. Kaza was a file sharing site, and the Record Industry Association of America had basically taken them to court for allowing for illegal music downloads. The consequence of that was that Skype could not start in Silicon Valley because the minute the founders touched US soil, there were subpoenas against them. So almost by kind of uh, default, they set themselves up outside the US and London became the, the center for where they started. And that kicked off a huge ecosystem of startups got there. Transferwise, monetizes a whole bunch of companies that started out of London, which became the fintech hub for many years because the US took a more restrictive approach and other countries benefited. I'm afraid that something similar might be happening, afraid for the US, not otherwise, because other countries are taking a more liberal approach. In Germany, for example, 20% of a fund manager's allocation can be towards securities that basically have crypto assets denominated against them. They are allowing for that exposure. And I think that's healthy and encouraging insofar as it's done in a transparent and regulated way. You know, many people get afraid or shy of regulation. We actually welcome it because that's going to take care of some of the, the maverick behavior or even the kind of um, potentially illegal behavior you've been seeing there. So countries like Dubai or rather the United Emirates and, and some parts of Europe, some parts of the Far East are far more progressive in their approach towards this, which I think is going to show long-term uh, long benefits for them. Bundy, it's so nice to have a digital asset expert to join us today and provide a global overview. Thank you, Bundy. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure.